There's a lot in Shakespeare about the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. But from the Buddhist point of view, there's nothing particularly outrageous about these things. It's ordinary, everyday fortune, ordinary, everyday life. There's a lot of slings and arrows, pain. Is an arrow, as the Buddha said. We have one pain, one arrow, but then we shoot ourselves with more arrows around the pain. This applies not only to physical pain, but also to mental pain. As it turns out, that it's the extra arrows. The Buddha says there's a second arrow, but actually there are a lot more than that. We just keep shooting ourselves again and again and again. Those are the ones that really pain the mind much more than the first arrow. In a way, that's good news, because we can learn how to stop shooting those arrows. We find that when we do, it's a lot easier to bear living in the world with those single arrows that come our way. Of course, you think about somebody shooting him or herself with an arrow. Imagine what kind of posture that would be like. You've got the bow aimed right at you, you've got the arrow aimed right at you, and there's already an arrow there in your chest, and you just the fact that you're holding the bow to shoot yourself. That would create extra pain. So this is why we train the mind so that it can see things and just leave them be, hear things and leave them be. Of course, the mind has the tendency to go out and run after these things. So we've got to give it something else to run after. This is why we turn around and work with the breath. Create a comfortable space inside, a comfortable sense of this is where we belong. And the arrows don't have to reach here. You can be aware of them, but they don't stick all the way inside. They don't reach in here, so you're, you've got at least a safe place. And it's having this safe place, a sense of well-being, a sense of spaciousness inside. That makes it a lot easier to put up with difficulties outside, and even the secondary arrows that you shoot as you're trying to learn not to shoot them. That you've got some place where you can rest. Maybe not all the time, but you get better and better. And having this sense of well-being, this is what makes patience and endurance possible. In other words, you learn to focus not just on the things that are difficult and bang your head against them. Instead, you focus on where there's a source of strength inside. And this can be physically with the breath, it can also be with the attitudes that you bring to things. This is what the Dharma is for. It's all for putting an end to suffering. It's all something that we can use. The reflections on aging, illness, and death are not meant to make you discourage them and to make you realize that this is universal. Reflections on separation. Again, it's supposed to be universal realizing everybody goes through this. It's not particularly outrageous. It's something normal. The Thai translation of that chant we do often, aging, or subject to aging, illness, and death, they translate as aging is normal, illness is normal, death is normal. And we can have that attitude, that relieves a lot of the pain. So the teachings are all here, the skills of concentration, the skills of mindfulness, the, the skills of discernment. So we're helping us master this skill of knowing how not to suffer, not to shoot ourselves with those extra errors. It's something we can do. We we'll catch ourselves in the midst of doing it and ask ourselves why. And that ability to ask yourself why is the beginning of your way out. Why am I doing this? No one's telling you that you have to do it. You may have picked up some ideas from society outside, your family, your friends, about how this is the way you're supposed to react to the world. But it's good to have alternative patterns. 
This is why we have teachers. This is why we have books on Dharma, to show you that there are other alternatives. Even though the world is full of arrows, you don't have to shoot yourself with the arrows. You can create your space inside where the arrows can't reach. And as you work with this, you find that there's something even deeper still inside that you don't have to create. And that's totally immune. So we live in a dangerous world, but the big dangers come in our own minds. Fortunately, the way out of that danger comes from within as well. And the first step in meditation is to get settled in with the breath, settled in with the body. More consistently, you can stay with the breath, stay with the body. The more the mind will settle down. Mindfulness leads naturally into concentration this way. The concentration gives you a sense of well-being. If you find yourself getting worked up about how the mind's not settling down tonight, you say, well, there must be some place inside here where things are at ease. If you don't like focusing on the breath, that the breath is getting all tangled up. As you, the more you try to adjust it, the worse it gets. You say, well, let's be with the bones. You don't have to do anything with the bones. They just sit there. Try to be as patient as the, as the bones. Holding that perception in mind helps, helps you deal with a lot of things. And this is the, not just the power of concentration, but also the power of discernment that allows you to be with things, and not bring them in to make yourself suffer. You can be with the awareness, you can be with the bones, you can be with something, anything in your range of awareness that seems solid, unaffected by things. This doesn't mean that you're in, insensitive, simply that you've found a safer place from which to watch things, a safer perspective from which to watch things. Not bring them in to shoot yourself in the heart. So patience is possible, but it requires having the right attitude and the right skills. But these are things we can master. So there are these qualities in the mind. You dig down, you find them that they're not harmed by anything. They're not engaged with the suffering. They're not engaged with the cause of suffering. As part of the path, you nourish them. And when you reach the goal, you don't have to do anything more, even less of a burden. Then you look back and you see the way that you were constantly feeding on things outside. That's why you shoot yourself with arrows. You're actually feeding on the arrows. No wonder it hurts. For the concentration, you give yourself some, something better to feed on. And then the things used to go running out to, to lay claim to the things, but the mind would flow out to lay claim to. You see, you don't have to go there. You'd be exposing yourself to danger. There's nothing to show for it, aside from a lot of arrow wounds. So stay right here. A sense of well-being right here. Then you can live with the arrows, but you don't have to suffer from them. This is the Buddha's special skill, a special gift to us. You think of all the different things he could have taught after his awakening. All the visions he'd had of the worlds and all the various things he came to understand in the night of his awakening and in the 49 nights and days afterwards. And of course, in the course of his many years after that. But it said he taught something that's for our well being, a skill that we can use, that can be passed on from generation to generation. This is how you live with the arrows, but don't suffer from the arrows. This is how you remove those arrows from your heart. The Buddha had that level of compassion. So it's only appropriate that we 
but have the same compassion at least for ourselves. That's how we keep the teachings alive so they can get passed on to the next generation. So it's not just ourselves, but this is where it begins. <laughs>